I forgot to announce this. Come on up, babe. Hallelujah. This is my gift from God. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He is the absolute best. There has never been a day that I thought, gee, I wish I wouldn't have married him. I'm so glad. It, it has been <laughs> That's wonderful. Good news. But Amen. on Thursday, it was his 65th birthday. That's right. <laughs> whoop, whoop. Amen. Doesn't he look young? He Amen. is young. I was thinking, well, we, we've got a good 15, 20 more years before we ever start feeling older. Amen. That's so right. would you help just shout it out? Happy birthday to my love. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, sweetie. Mwah. Praise the Lord. Good job. Now, looking at that picture right there, I want you to know that there's confetti falling or something. Those are not lumps on my head. Those are, <laughs> people are going to think, Brother Watts is diseased or something. He, he needs an appointment. Please be seated. God bless you. It's good to see you today. Amen. 65, that's right. We've asked the Lord. I, I asked him for 20 more years of vital ministry, and I'm believing for my uh, 120 years. Praise the Lord. I might begin to slow down a little bit when I'm 85. Maybe, maybe. I'm not sure. But um, I'll, at least I'll start to take naps after lunch or something when I'm 85. And, um, but I got a lot of work to do for Jesus. I'm not about to slow down and just, I feel like I'm in the prime of life. 65 is the new uh, 64, I think, because I feel so good. <laughs> I, feel, I, I feel young today. I, and so anyways, God bless you. Thank you for the well wishes. And uh, it's fun to turn 65 because you don't have to really do anything but get up in the morning and be 65. So uh, <laughs> birthdays are great. Glory to God. Amen. Thank you for that. Um, I would like to start out this uh, message with a uh, little bit of uh, media to help us kind of get into it. But before we show that, and y'all can begin to cue that up back there, just a little teaching aid, um, hold your Bibles up with me and say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. Where's AJ? I saw AJ get there. He is right there. AJ, I'm so glad you're here. God bless you. This young man, the sky's the limit for that young man. He blesses me so much. I tell you what, the, he is a superstar. He's a superstar athlete, but more than that, he's just a superstar. He is awesome, awesome, awesome. That's Ariane. Well, you look just like AJ, your brother. Praise. You're a superstar too. Praise the Lord. Everybody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hold your Bible up and say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I'll never, never, never doubt this word because it is the word of God. I've got ears to hear and a heart to receive. So teach to me the word of God. I want to talk a, a little bit today about the tabernacle of Moses in relation to the pattern of prayer. I found a little video online that kind of gives the illustration of how the tabernacle of Moses was set up. It's only three minutes long, so if we could lower the lights and show that video, let's receive that teaching.
Hallelujah. Amen. Now, I took time to show that because there is a pattern that God has handed down to His people in trying to teach them how to approach Him. Very, very simple structure, but full of meaning, full of symbolism. When God brought His people out of Egypt and Israel is His nation and the Jews are His people, We have been engrafted, but they are the called out nation of God. That has not changed. And I'm thankful for that. And we are a supporter of Israel. And I pray America never turns its back on Israel. There is such a thing as the judgment of the nations. And that is God judging the nations on how they treated Israel. We better never turn our back on Israel. Come on, somebody, say amen. Amen. When God brought his people out of Egypt after centuries of oppression, he had to teach them how to be a nation. And so through the prophecy and the office of Moses going up the Mount Sinai, getting the law coming down, God handed down to them structure, national structure, national identification. He taught them the law. He taught them uh, the customs of a nation. He taught them how a nation was supposed to behave, what the heart of a nation was. But most particularly, he taught them how to approach him. He taught them how to worship. And the worship would uh, really tell the tale of the plan of redemption because it was all about the sacrifice. It was all about the substitution. It was all about the spilling of blood. It was all about the judgment on the sacrifice rather than the judgment on the people. And uh, in the structure of the tabernacle, God told Moses, this is exactly the way I want it to be. Now, it is a simple structure because it had to be designed for mobility. The nation was going from one place to another place. They were headed to the promised land, and it had to be a structure that would move with God as God led the nation. And so it was able to be taken down and put back up. And so even though it is simple in its look, it's only an outside curtain forming a courtyard and then a smaller structure on the inside that is just 15 feet wide and 45 feet long that's divided into two rooms. One is called the holy place. The other is called the holy of holies. It is 15 by 15 by 15, four square, it's a cube. And uh, as simple as it can be, but yet it is very complex because the design tells a story. It is an illustrated sermon right down to the materials that are used, to the embroidery on the curtains, to the structure, the way it is set up. But most interesting to me is the central role that the tabernacle of Moses or the tent of meeting played in the national identity of Israel because it was stationed in the heart of the nation. All of the tribes of Israel were assigned camping places around the tabernacle of meeting or the tabernacle of Moses. And so you would have tribes to the north, you'd have tribes to the east, you have tribes to the west, you have tribes to the south, evenly divided up. And uh, artists have rendered them in in numbering out the tribes and the places where the Bible has placed them. And it looks like a perfect cross to me. It It is so rich in its symbolism. But right in the middle of it was the tabernacle of worship. Right in the middle of it was the place of sacrifice, the place of prayer, the place of meeting with God. I think the idea of having the place of worship central to the nation, not just central in their, uh, the, in their hearts and thinking, but physically central in the nation, I think that had to influence the nation. 
I think that had to be a strong part of their identity, don't you? I think we got to move God back into the middle of America once again. <laughs> I think we've got to get Jesus back into the center of our homes, back into the center of our government, back into the center of our schools, back into the center of our arts and entertainment, back into the center of our economy, back into the center of our technology, back into the center of our being as a nation because the Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and somehow the Word of God, the presence of God, the honor for the Lord has been pushed to the side as Babylon has tried to erect its own tower once again saying we'll build a socialist paradise. I say no, no, no. We just need to get God back into the middle of it and everything else will fall into place. Somebody give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. 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 Well, in this structure that was in the center of the nation, you see that it was sort of built in a concentric design. You have the larger court, and then you have the holy place, and then you have the holy of holies. And in that concentric design... You have the outside court is the place of sacrifice. It is the place of washing. The, ple the priest would prepare himself with his priestly garments to enter into the holy place. In the holy place, there was the, the bread. There was the candelabra. There was the altar of incense. And then once a year, one priest, the high priest, would go in to the holy of holies. There was only one piece of furniture in the holy of holies, and that was the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the Ark, which was a box uh, laden over with gold, inside that box there would be the the Ten Commandments, there was Aaron's rod that budded, there was a bowl of manna, eventually all ended up in there. And that's where God met man. That's where the glory filled the tabernacle. Someone say, praise the Lord. I'm looking for more glory. We need the glory once again in the house of God. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Aren't you? Glory to God. And so in this process of concentric circles, there is a narrowing and narrowing and narrowing down to one man once a year could enter into the presence of God. Now, through the gospel narrative, we understand that Jesus has rent the veil, that we can all now go into the presence of God. We do not need another human priest to go before us. We have a high priest in Jesus Christ. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and we can go boldly, the Bible says in Hebrews, boldly in times of need to find grace. So we can enter in boldly, but the lesson is still to be learned through this uh, illustrated sermon, as it were, in the architecture of the tabernacle of Moses, and then again in the temple of Solomon, the same architectural structure, even though it's probably twice the size of what the tabernacle was, God is showing us how to come in to His presence. Everybody said, Amen, amen. and Amen. Well, there are three areas in the tabernacle of Moses. There is the outer court, there is the holy place, there is the holy of holies. And I think we have a slide of the tabernacle, if we could put that up real quick. Just the whole area with the courtyard area and then the holy, uh, holy place and then the holy of holies. You see it there. Isn't that a simple looking structure? But you see there's one entry in. There's the gate, that red uh, gated area there. And then there is the covered tabernacle. The front part, the first 30 feet of it is the holy place. And that is uh, where most of the priests could go in and serve the Lord. And then behind another veil was the holy of holies. And that is where the Ark of the Covenant was. And then there's the glory that descended upon the Ark of the Covenant. Praise the Lord. Lord, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Now, 
In the outer court, if we are going to liken this to the pattern of prayer approaching God, we approach God in prayer, and so we do not have to go through the offering of animal sacrifice and the washing and the golden labor and all of that because Jesus has done that for us. He has been that. He is the Lamb of God. There is no sac more sacrifice that needs to be made. Now our approach to God is is in prayer. And so when we approach God and we enter in through the gate, how do we enter in the gates? With thanksgiving, with praise. And so when we enter into the outer court, uh, that prayer is the prayer of our need. That's where sacrifice is made. In fact, every area of this has sacrifice involved. It has the Word involved. It has the presence of God involved. But when you go into the outer court, that is when you're praying for yourself. You are laying your self-will upon the altar. And you're praying, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. If you have ever started a prayer time with the Lord, the first thing that you want to do is enter in with praise and with worship. That's what we do in every church service. In fact, church services are called worship services because they are declaring the worthiness of God. So when you walk into the presence of God, let me encourage you, start declaring the worthiness of God. Start praising Him. Start magnifying magnifying Him. Start glorifying Him. Just exalt His holy name. And when you exalt Him and when you magnify Him, you begin to realize in comparison to Him, we need a lot of help, don't we? There's some issues in our life that we need to lay down our selfishness. We need to lay down our self-will. We need to topple our own thrones. Come on, church. We need to get over ourselves uh, and get hold of Him. So the outer court is where you take care of yourself. The outer court is where you take care of your need. In the outer court, that is where they made the sacrifice of the animal, the shedding of blood, and then the priest would walk over to what was called the lavier. It was a, a pool of water in a giant bowl, a, a bronze bowl, and it was polished, 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 so that when the priest would wash himself before he would go into the holy place to offer the blood upon the the Ark of the Covenant, he would wash himself, he would be clothed in white garments. But as he would wash himself, he would bend over and he would see a reflection of himself in that polished, polished bronze. You know, the washing of the water of the Word is when we get a reflection of ourselves. <laughs> Have you ever read the Word of God and came away with an impression of yourself in comparison to the Word of God. In other words, have you read the Word of God and realized, I've got to grow up? Have you read the Word of God and realized, there's some things i got to work on. I have not arrived. If the Apostle Paul said that he has not arrived, I must admit, I have not arrived. Come on, somebody help me today. The washing of the water of the Word is when you bend over and you get a reflection of yourself in that polished bronze lavier and you begin to see yourself as a reflection through the washing water, through the Word of God. Listen, I think the biggest challenge that the church of Jesus Christ is facing right now is we're trying to interpret the Word of God in context to what all the social mores are of the day. Let me encourage you. We don't interpret the Word of God according to what's happening in the world world. Uh, you need to start interpreting what's happening in the world according to the Word of God. The world is not our lens. The Word of God is our lens. Um, come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. So when we enter into the outer court, we're entering into a prayer phase uh, 
where we are seeing ourselves in reflection to the Word of God. This is where we're taking care of our need. This is where we're taking care of our burdens. This is where we're taking care of our situation. How many of y'all know that life is complicated sometimes? Uh, uh, come on. How many of y'all know that life can be challenging sometimes? Uh, how many of y'all know that life can be life? <laughs> sure it can. But this is what you take care of in the outer courts before you go into the holy place. Now, once you have taken care of that, and if you have ever prayed, and, and unfortunately, a lot of people never get past the outer courts. They come with their prayer list, their prayer needs, and they say, God, I need this, and I need this, and I need this, and I need this. And they lay it all out, and the Lord says, I'm going to do something about that. I'm going to bless you in those areas. I'm going to give you strategy for victory in those areas. I'm going to help you to grow up in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. More washing of the Word, more sacrifice of your self-will. Come on, let's get this taken care of. And then we tend to turn around and walk out the way we came in. And God says, hang on, hang on, hang on. There's more prayer. There's deeper prayer. There's more, there's more, hallelujah. So now I want to talk about the prayer of intercession. Because the prayer of intercession is not for the outer court. The, the outer court was in the natural sunlight where natural things are affecting your life. It's what you see. It's what you feel. It's what you're going through. It's the experience of life. It's everything that's just sort of happening to you. And you come into the outer court and you say, Lord, this is the way it is. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm going through. And God says, I'll help you with all those kind of things. Let's take care of that. Praise the Lord. He says, then, okay, now come on in. I want to take you another step. I want to take you to another place. I want to take you to the inside uh, where the holy place is because there's another level of prayer in the holy place. Now, in the holy place, it was a different kind of illumination. In the holy place, it was a different kind of word. In the holy place, it's a different kind of sacrifice. In the courtyard, there was the altar, the brazen altar of sacrifice. The animal was killed. The blood was shed. There was the brazen altar for the washing. So there was sacrifice. There was the washing of the water of the Word. There was the presence of God and natural illumination. But in the... Is anybody following me today? I'm having a good time. I hope you're following me. But in the holy place, that first room that you entered into in the tabernacle, that first room called the holy place, there's a different illumination. There was a candelabra. There was a different sacrifice. It's called the altar of incense. There's a different word. It's called the showbread, the, the table of showbread. So there's still the word of God. There's still sacrifice. There's still presence of God. But it's a different light of presence. It's a different sacrifice. Now it's the sacrifice of prayer and intercession. There's a different word. Now it's the word. Not you don't wash with it now. Now you eat it. Now you get it in you. You're not washing with it now. Now you're feasting on the Word. You've already seen your reflection through the Word. You already know what needs to be changed. Now you're getting the Word in you. Now you're praying the Word. And this kind of, the, the altar's different now. That was the altar of sacrifice. This altar of sacrifice is called the altar of incense. It symbolizes the prayers that go up before the Lord. And, and now you're not praying about yourself anymore. You took care of that outside. Now there's a different illumination on your spirit. It is the candelabra, the presence of God. The illumination of God fills this room. And now you start to see things differently. You've taken care of the stuff about you out there. And now you're going to start interceding for others. Interceding for the nation. Interceding for the things the Holy Spirit puts on your heart. When you get into intercession, that means you're standing in the gap you've gone into a deeper level to do deeper work it's going to be warfare you're going to press in you're going to stand in the gap you're going to get on the wall you're going to pray come on now you're going to pray glory to God 
because you're having a different experience with God. Your different prayer experience is not like the courtyard prayer experience. That was all about you. You were laid on the altar. We got all that taken care of. Glory to God. Just don't turn around and walk out at that point. No, go in to the deeper place. Um, and in the deeper place, the prayer is not about you anymore. It's about intercession for others. Intercession for the nation. Intercession for thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Come on. And so now we're, we're interceding this different kind of prayer altogether. It is a more demanding prayer. It's easy to pray your list of needs because everybody knows what they need. Come on, everybody knows every bill that needs to be paid and this and that and everything that needs to be taken care of. We know that. But now when you get into intercession, that's a different thing. And the illumination of the lamp, of the candelabra or the Holy Spirit that is shining on you is, is inspiring you to pray differently. The Word of God that used to reflect you is now inside you, and it causes you to pray differently. You know exactly what, I've talk, what I'm talking about because if you have ever prayed in the natural where you're praying against what you're experiencing, against what you're feeling, against the situations of your life, and then you feel yourself going transitioning from all about you to an intercessionary prayer, a standing in the gap prayer, a standing on the wall prayer, a prayer that that says, you know what? I'm not going to let this happen to my family. I'm not going to let this happen to my church. I'm not going to let this happen to my nation. I'm going to stand on the wall and I'm going to be the voice of one crying in the wilderness. If it's just me, then that's all right. It'll just be me. But I'm going to lift up my voice and I'm going to pray. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. In earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is looking for people to get on the wall. God is looking for churches to be the church. We've piddled around in the outer courts too long. I said we messed around too long in the outer courts. But there's a deeper experience, an intercessory experience where we say, we're not backing up anymore. We're not giving up any more land. We're not doing it. No, we are going to stay, make our stand. We are going to pray the prayer, the effective prayer. James said, the prayer of faith shall save the sick and God shall raise them up. There is prayers that need to be prayed for miracle signs and wonders. There's prayers that need to be prayed for the healing of the body. There's prayers that need to be prayed for the healing of the nation. There's prayers that need to be prayed for the boldness of the church. There's prayers that need to be prayed for the unity and the restoring of the family in this nation. Come on, church. There is prayer to undo ungodly laws and to implement godly statute, law, tradition in this nation. There is prayer that will call down the love of God like a mighty rushing river. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. To fill this nation. That's why a lot of prayers of a lot of Christians, when they see the desperate need, that prayer is, well, we'll see what happens. Well, We'll just let it run its course. Well, these kind of things happen to everybody. Well, and well, and well. Because people are trying to address desperate, drastic warfare issues by praying in the outer court when that prayer only comes from the inner. You can't pray that stuff on the outer. The outer is for the outer, but once you get into the holy place, the miracles are in the holy place. 
The power is in the holy place. And if you've been in the holy place, you know the power. You know the power. There is power to heal. There's power to deliver. There's power to turn it around. There's power to save a nation. There's power. Come on. Jonah preached a little old sermon and it caused Nineveh to turn around. It doesn't take a lot of words. It just takes the power of God manifest in a nation. Elijah didn't pay, pray a lot of words, but he prayed the words that brought the fire down. Come on. There's power in the holy place of God. Can you imagine being dressed in those priestly garments and walking through that courtyard and seeing that veiled entry get closer and closer and closer in your image and there is the bowl of cleansing before you. You've already got the blood from the sacrifice and now you're cleansed and now you're clothed and now you're robed in those priestly garments and you walk through that, that veil and now you're entering into the holy place. The nation is gathered around a about every tent of the nation is focused in to the center of the nation. They're focused on where the glory comes down. They're focused on the tabernacle of meeting. They're focused on the tabernacle of Moses. And you're the one that's walking into the holy place. You've got the blood covered hyssop. You're ready to apply the blood in the holy of holies. But now you're in a room. Before you can walk into that holy of holies, you got the the illumination of the Spirit of God on one side. You've got the showbread of the Word of God on the other side. Right in front of you, you've got the altar of incense, which stands for the prayers of the saints. And you are now standing between the three great instruments of God. His illumination, His Word, His sacrifice of prayer. And you're the one that's in that room. Let me tell you, every single believer is a priest of the most high God and we are called to enter in to the holy place make our prayers of intercession for a nation today is Father's Day men of faith day men let me encourage you men let me encourage you to be a man of great prayer I'm not saying that you have to be eloquent I just say you have to be great I'm not saying that you have to be King James prayers I just saying you just have to be sincere in your heart prayers I'm saying don't hang out in the outer courts any longer men you are a priest of the most high you're a pillar in the body of Christ you are set apart unto God. Get into the holy place, man. Stand in the gap. Get on the wall. Pray the prayers of intercession for your wife, for your kids, for your family. Don't let the devil have them. Don't let drugs get them. Don't let this society lie to them and steal from them. Don't let this world have them. You're a man of God. You're the one that stands between them and the devil. Hallelujah. We need to stand up, men. We need to stand up and tell the devil, you can't have my family. You can't have my marriage. You can't have my kids. Come on, church. We need to start telling some of our politicians, no, we ain't taking that junk anymore. I don't care if you write it in law. It's not written in God's law. God will turn it around. God's not putting up with that. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We have a showdown going on in our country right now. There is a clashing of cultures right now in this country between the godly and the ungodly, between Christ and Antichrist. 
the church of Jesus Christ has a calling, has a responsibility to get out of the outer courts. Listen, in the outer courts, all we're saying is, is the natural stuff. The natural light is coming down upon us, and we're saying what's happening in the natural. They're so mean to us. They don't play fair. They're cheating. They're ungodly. They're antichrist in their ways. Look at that Jezebel. Look at that Ahab. Aren't they mean? Ouch, ouch. Ouch, ouch. It's so bad. But listen, that's not where we're supposed to be praying at. That's, that is the prayers of your natural experience. You need to come on, church. We need to get into the holy place. We need to start rebuking that Jezebel spirit. We need to start rebuking that Moloch spirit. We need to start rebuking that Python spirit. We need to start rebuking this, the things that are ungodly, antichrist, full of flesh, we need to stand in the gap and say, no, no, hallelujah, hallelujah. With Roe versus Wade about to be overturned, is a deciding moment in the spiritual life of our nation. It's passed back in the 70s in an ungodly fashion. And through fighting and fighting and prayer and warfare and fighting and more prayer and more warfare, now we're finally getting this thing turned around. And the Antichrist spirits, they're mad. They're upset. They're violent. They're cursing. They're threatening. What does that mean? We just need to get into the holy place. We need to get into the holy place. And let me tell you something else. There is a, listen, the evil genius of the Antichrist spirit passed a ruling to the Supreme Court decades ago that they misidentified or misdefined this idea of the division of church and state. The, listen, the church and state were always meant to live in harmony. They were never meant to live at one another's throats. It was not meant to be one or the other. It was simply a determination that in the United States of America, we did not want a state-run church. It wasn't that the church, that the state was supposed to attack the church or the state was supposed to deny the church, but those evil geniuses got us to redefine the idea of separation of church and state. So now nothing about God, nothing about the Word, no prayer, no, no uh, faith, no Bible can be in any of our institutions, cannot be in the public square. I want to turn it around. 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 Turn it around. You know, many said that, that Roe versus Wade would never be overturned. Here we're watching it getting overturned right now. I'm believing that separation of church and state thing can be overturned. How do you, how do you know? Because I've been into the holy place. I've been into the holy place. I know the power of God. I know the power of God when it comes to prayer. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Prayer is the place where the impossible is possible. Prayer is the place of the miraculous. Prayer is the place where there is no limits, no lack, no loss. Because the prayer is the place where you're entering into the presence of God, uh, and in God, uh, there are no limits. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Whatsoever things, whatsoever, without limit. Pray the impossible is possible because it's 
a whatsoever thing. Amen. Whatsoever things you desire. God did not put limits on that. It just has to be according to His will. And I know what His will is. His will is abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Somebody say amen. amen. So when you enter into the holy place, now you're praying the prayer of intercession, and you're praying without limit. You're pray, praying prayers that, that other people would laugh at you if they heard you pray in those prayers. But you're in the presence of God. You're in a unique place. You're in a whole different environment. The, the light of God is shining on you. The Word of God is filling you. The incense of God's possibilities, the prayers are filling your nostrils. Now you're just intoxicated with God. Hallelujah. It's just that anything is possible. All things are possible. Just believe. Don't fear. Just believe. Just believe. All things are possible to him who believes. Mark 9, 23. That's what Jesus said. But there's another room. There's another room. The outside court is about you. It's uh, just taking care of business. The holy place is about intercession. That's where you get on the wall, stand in the gap, take care of business for God. But the holy of holies is a whole different ball game. It's the deepest place. There is a veil that stands between the holy place and the holy of holies. Think of it. This room, 15 by 15 by 15, four square. And all of the acreage of planet Earth. In all of the expanse of the universe, this is the holiest place on the planet. 15 by 15 by 15. How big is your prayer closet? How big is your prayer closet? I was writing my notes and I was sitting in our TV room and I looked around. I said, you know what? This room is about 15 by 15 by 10. <laughs> I, knew it. <laughs> I knew it was only 10 feet, so we're only about lacking a little bit. In the Holy of Holies, there's one piece of furniture because that's all you need. It's a box covered with gold holding the artifacts of God's goodness. The law that he wrote with his own finger handed down to Moses. The mercy and miraculous power of God in the rod of Aaron that budded. The provision of God in the bowl of manna. That box is where God met man. That box is where the glory fell down. But more importantly, that box is where the blood would be applied. You see, the priest on the Day of Atonement would take the blood from the outside at the altar, and he would walk through the holy place into the holy of holies. And they would tie a rope to his leg with bells on his skirt. And if the bells ever stopped ringing, they would know that God struck him dead because he was unclean. You can't be unclean and offer the blood. Thank God the blood cleanses us. Thank you, Jesus. He would go in and he would sprinkle the blood on the lid of that box, the Ark of the Covenant. And that blood covered the broken law that no man could keep. 
That blood covered our sins. That blood turned the seat of judgment into the mercy seat. That's why the lid was called the mercy seat, because blood is what gave us mercy. Thank you, Jesus. He would apply blood to that, and God would meet the man of God, the priest right there. When you enter into the Holy of Holies in your prayer time, this is the time of communion with the Lord. You're not praying for your needs in the outer court. You're not intercessing for the nation or your family or your marriage. Now you have entered into sweet communion with God. This is the place where there is no agenda. This is the place where you just want to spend time in God's glory. This is the place where you're just lifting up your heart before the Lord and you're saying, God, download into me everything you've got. I want your creative power. I want your wisdom. I want your revelation. I want your will. I want everything that you've got to be poured into me. I just want to spend time in your glory. I'm not here with an agenda, Lord. I'm here to commune with you, Lord. And that's why praying in the Spirit is so important. Praying in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit. Oh, yes, where the the presence and the glory of God is poured out on the believer. And the believer is filled with God's presence. Yes, there's sacrifice because the blood is being applied. And yes, there is word. It's within the Ark of the Covenant. And yes, there is presence. It's His glory filling the Holy of Holies. The only light in the Holy of Holies was the glory of God. That's the only light you want. That's the only light you need to fill your spirit in that prayer time. We say so too very often, I feel like my prayers are ineffective. Well, it's not that they're ineffective. It's just have you gone the next step? Maybe you've prayed for your need and your wounds and your suffering Great. That's not ineffective. Now, let's go into the holy of place where you're praying intercessory prayers, where you're standing in the gap. Yeah, it's warfare. It's tough. Yeah, it, it, you, you're going to be putting yourself on the wall, on the line. But we need people to pray those prayers, especially in this day. We need people to pray those prayers. And then there's the innermost place. Very few People go into the Holy of Holies just to commune with God. Usually, I'll get with you later, Lord. I'm too busy right now. Usually, I don't have time for that right now. Usually, I wouldn't even know what to do about that right now. No, the communion with God is a sweet moment of fellowship with the Lord that is unlike any other experience you can have in your humanity. Hallelujah. The pattern of prayer. God laid it out and illustrated his sermon when he gave us the tabernacle of Moses, later the temple of Solomon. He says, this is how you approach me. It's going to come through steps and stages. And each, each step and stage is going to have a time of presence of God. It's going to have a time of sacrifice, something that's going to have to be given up. And it's going to have a time of word. But as you get from one place to the middle place to the inner place, that's when you have an experience with God that will change your life. Did you get anything out of this today? Praise the Lord.